thank you for joining us this evening on The Frame, brought to you by Access Framingham. My name is Brendan Fitzpatrick. We begin tonight with an update on financial matters in the city, as Framingham City Councilors are looking to ensure more financial transparency in the future. At their November 9th meeting, District 8 City Councilor John Stefanini presented an agenda item in an attempt to make more records publicly available. Stefanini said that he and other finance subcommittee members have been left with little results on financial data requested multiple times during the year. While a sheet of the city's expenditures has been offline after originally being available to community members. I mean, I'm not trying to be difficult, but it's hard to analyze and look at information when the reports we've requested, the reports we've voted for, the things we've asked for just aren't being delivered which is why I asked to put this on the agenda because I wasn't sure how else to get it. Luis Miller, Framingham's Chief Financial Officer and Director of Administration and Finance, was in attendance at the meeting to address those concerns. She said the city is currently without an accountant and assistant accountant, meaning that the city's Technology Services Department would need to find out how long it would take to get the information that Stefanini had referenced. Phil Ottaviani, the chair of the council and the councillor for District 6, said that officials, quote, need to get to the bottom of these matters. We need to tighten some things up. We really do. You know, how, how do we run a $400 million corporation without an accountant and an assistant accountant? you got to be kidding so, me. Miller's explanation you, noted that the entire answer? municipal government landscape is faced with shortages and a lack of competitive wages, making the situation tough to navigate. Recruiting agencies have been solicited by Framingham in order to fill those open roles, according to Miller. It is a problem right now okay. that there is a shortage of accountants, there is a shortage of treasure collectors, and there is a shortage of assessors in the state. Until those jobs can be brought back into the fold, Miller said that she's taken on more financial responsibilities, like checking payrolls and purchase orders. Stefanini expressed concerns that it could look like a system that lacks checks and balances is currently in place. But Miller said those practices involve multiple parts of the municipal government, not just her office. Michael Cannon, District 4 City Councilor, asked Miller if no longer paying for that online bookkeeping service meant that the city has, quote, chosen to be less transparent. Miller disagreed with that assessment, adding that the city is working towards bringing the original accounting software, OpenGov, back for the public to view. That switch was originally made during Yvonne Spicer's tenure as mayor, according to Miller. The financial transparency matter has been referred to the finance subcommittee. We've all talked a lot about transparency and this is a really important way to be, you know, meaningful with our, our words. In other news, another version of a bill aiming to lower prescription drug costs across Massachusetts was unveiled by the state Senate late last week. The PACT Act, short for an act relative to pharmaceutical access, cost and transparency, seeks to lower drug prices and increase pharmaceutical access for Bay State residents while also adding additional health care system oversight. Out-of-pocket costs for asthma, diabetes and heart condition medications would be capped if the bill is signed into law. All insurers, including MassHealth, would have to offer both generic and name brand insulin options, while copays would not exceed $25 for a 30-day supply. Those stipulations were not included in the 2019 and 2022 versions of the Senate-approved legislation, which both failed to garner House approval. President of the Massachusetts Senate and Senator for the 2nd Middlesex and Norfolk District, Karen Spilka, said in an exclusive interview with The Frame that this legislation is vital to reducing the cost of expensive medications. This bill will help. It may not be the, you know, the be all and end all, but it will definitely have an incredible positive impact on our residents, especially our seniors and, and others. Additional parts of the PACT Act 3.0 include mandates that patients would not pay more than the retail price of a drug, expanded choices on where residents can get their pharmaceutical needs, and the creation of a trust fund to help residents in communities of color and low income communities pay for the prescriptions they need. Senators on Beacon Hill voted to pass the bill this week. Spilka is confident that the Senate and the House can come to an agreement before sending the legislation to be signed by Governor Mara Healey prior to the end of the current legislative session. Speaking of Governor Healy, she unveiled another piece of legislation recently, this time aimed at expanding benefits for veterans of the armed forces. 
The HERO Act, another acronym bill, this time short for an act honoring, empowering, and recognizing our service members and veterans, proposes things like behavioral health treatment expansions, boosts like tax credits to businesses who hire vets, and increasing the disabled veteran annuity by $500. IVF reimbursement would be provided to LGBTQ plus couples initially denied by the Veterans Health Administration via a pilot program established by the plan, while the Veterans Equity Review Board would expand their scope of work to go beyond discharges stemming from the military's Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy on non-heterosexual people, which ran from 1994 to 2011. The actual Chapter 115 definition of a vet would be expanded as well, in an attempt to be more in line with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs' definition and to ensure that more vets are eligible for additional resources like annuity and the Veterans Homes program. This all comes as here locally, Fred Framingham officials are seeking residents to join the Veterans Council. Veteran-related manners like memorials, policies, and future projects are all deliberated by the seven-member council before their suggestions are passed on to Mayor Charlie Sasitsky. The deadline to apply for the council is December 15th. As the city looks forward to welcoming people onto that board, they also took the time this past weekend to honor local vets through the nation's history during a Veterans Day ceremony this past Saturday. The mayor was joined by local veterans and other community leaders and residents in honoring those who served. U.S. Representative for the 5th Massachusetts District, Catherine Clark, was also in attendance, echoing the goals of providing important resources for veterans. From the days of, found, of our founding, brave men and women have laid down the joys of their lives for the sake of our country. The least we can do, our responsibility, is to fulfill our promise for those veterans who return home. A group of local residents are banding together and calling upon the Metro West Wellness Center to reopen their aquatic therapy pools. Seniors, those with disabilities, and others recovering from surgeries and other ailments have utilized the pools to stay active. Two of those people are C. Patrick Dunn, a current Framingham Council on Aging member who has needed physical therapy for about a decade, and Steve Kiviat, a resident who, after being prescribed aquatic therapy by his doctor to aid his knees, recently began the regimen. They and other proponents contend that Metro West Medical Center, operated by the Texas-based Tenet Healthcare Corps, are in the words of Dunn, quote, working against, end quote, both the senior and disabled populations region-wide. Right now, there's a big sign out on Route 9 that says Metro West Wellness Center. Well, they need to change the name of the sign if they don't want to provide this service to help people stay healthy and well. There's a certain benefit. They, they're intangible, but, you know, you could put dollars to how much community support for the hospital is going to decrease with this exercise. There's a time when you don't have to make money to supply health care. You can't do it at, at people's lives. In a statement provided to the frame, officials with Metro West Medical Center said, quote, after careful consideration and thorough review, Metro West Medical Center decided to pause the aquatic therapy program. This is to ensure appropriate access to resources for high quality critical health care services that the hospital provides to the community. We are supporting the transition to nearby aquatic therapy options for our patients. In the meantime, Dunn and the rest of the Council on Aging requested that their CEO, John Whitlock, attend a city council meeting with members of the public, also available to provide their thoughts on what the COA described as the, quote, degradation of services. Head to our website if you want to read more details about that aquatic therapy story or anything covered tonight www.theframe.news. Stories like these, along with traffic and weather updates, are all there to keep you covered. Also, sign up for our newsletter to keep up to date with The Frame. If you've got a tip for us, email us at theframe at accessfram.tv or give us a call to our tip line. It's 508-216-0003. Following the three-alarm apartment fire that impacted the 1630 Worcester Road apartment complex late last month in Framingham, residents are being reminded by fire officials to stay safe with the holiday season and winter on the horizon. We took a visit to the headquarters of the National Fire Protection Association to learn more about how you can be mindful of fire risks this time of year. This is our weekly focus. Temperatures drop. 
people are using their heating system, so heating safety is really important. But at the same time, it's the holiday season. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. People are going to be doing a lot of cooking, and cooking is a leading cause of home fires year-round. Heating is another leading cause of home fires. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be decorating for the holidays, Christmas trees in homes. They're large flammable objects we bring into our homes, oftentimes being decorated with electrical lighting, might be using lots of candles. All these factors all present potential fire risks um, that people really need to be aware of and to take the steps necessary to minimize those risks. What are some specific tips to highlight to people to make sure that they're cooking safely this year? So the leading cause of cooking fires in homes is unattended cooking. So it's so important to stay focused on what you're cooking on the stove and what you've got in the oven, which sounds super simple, except that we're all so busy. We're trying to do a bunch of things at once, particularly on Thanksgiving. You have, in a lot of uh, instances, you have a lot of guests in your home, people that you aren't may not have seen in a long time. You might be, you know, want to talk with them. Lots of other distractions um, that make it easy to get pulled away from what's on the stove or in the oven um, because we know when people walk away, that's when problems happen. So as simple as it sounds, keeping a close eye on your cooking is one of the best things you can do. The other thing you want to do is make sure that you clear the cooking area of anything that can burn. So things like paper towels, oven mitts, um, dish towels, prepared food packaging, anything that can burn, keep it well away from the cooking area. Also want to keep children and pets well away from the cooking area. Other things you can do, turn pot and pan handles inward um, so no one can bump into them. And Thanksgiving, of course, being the kickoff of the holiday season, which leads to plenty more decorations, the lights like you mentioned. Yeah, we know that fresh Christmas trees are much more often involved in fires. So you really, if you have bringing a fresh tree in your home, that's important to consider. Especially as they dry out. And Exactly, so they dry out over time. So one of the really important things you can do is make sure you water the tree. You can see if there have been studies that have done between dried out trees and fresh trees, a dried out tree will go up in flames in seconds. But the truth is even a well watered tree does continue to dry out over time. So you really wanna be mindful of that. Christmas tree fires don't happen all that happen often, but when they do happen, they tend to be serious. So just something to really be mindful of. And of course, if you have electrical lighting on your tree or in other areas of your home, you wanna make sure it's in good working order and condition, um, no cracks, frays, if they're missing bulbs and you replace them, they're still not working, it's a sign that it's time to replace the lights. So lots of things that you can be aware of. One of the keys is having an awareness of where potential risks exist. And then it's just taking simple steps to prevent those kinds of fires from happening. Even candle fires, a lot of the same messaging between cooking, heating, um, using candles. It's paying close attention, monitoring carefully. Don't leave candles burning. Um, if they're not, if you're not in the same room, you want to really monitor them carefully. If you're using candles, make sure they're on a sturdy base. They're not in an area where they can be knocked over. If you leave the room or go to sleep, blow them out. So very simple steps can really go a long way toward having a festive and fire-free holiday. And as the holiday season wraps up, it's still in the middle, middle of the winter season. Um, a major a major factor to home fires that have been highlighted by fire departments across the area in recent years, anecdotally speaking, is space heaters, specifically yeah. those. How can people stay safe uh, in regards to that? Yeah, space heaters uh, play a large share of the home heating problem. So they're involved in a third of home heating fires, but they're responsible for nine out of 10 deaths and the majority of the injuries. So you really have to use space heaters with care and caution. You wanna make sure they're in good working order. Um, you wanna make sure, again, that you're monitoring them well. You don't wanna leave a space heater on when you're not in the room or you go to sleep. You never wanna use a space heater in a bedroom. Again, keep anything that can burn well away from a space heater. Make sure that you are using one that's been tested um, and approved by an independent testing laboratory. And then to store it well, you know, make sure you put it in a location where it's not gonna be exposed to moisture, where the cords are well protected. Make sure that the knobs are in good working order. You know, you wanna make sure that your equipment is functioning properly. Wonderful, again, Susie, we really appreciate you taking some time to speak with us today. Thank you so much. And if you want to learn more about fire safety at any time of the year, you can log online to www.nfpa.org. It's now time to take a look at what the weather might have in store for us. Friday calls for increasing cloud coverage, but take a look at this. 
Highs in the mid 60s. That's going to feel great for this time of year. Lows in the upper 40s as well. On Saturday, highs should remain in the mid to upper 50s. You can expect showers earlier in the day as well. Lows then cool down to the low 30s. As for Sunday, we're looking at some sunshine to finish off the weekend. Partly cloudy at times, highs in the upper 40s, and lows in the upper 20s. If you don't know, we're on Instagram. For daily updates and to tag us when you're out in the community, you can follow us at Frame News underscore. Also, subscribe to the Access Framingham YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new Frame episodes go up. Calling all cat lovers, this next story is for you. The Frame took a visit to the Metro West Humane Society where we got an inside look at all the hard work their shelter, its staff, and volunteers do every single day to care for our community's feline friends. The Frame's Mackenzie Wright and Jesse Godfrey take us there. What is it about cats that tug at our heartstrings? I love cats very much. I feel very calm near cats. They give me a lot of positive energy. Non-judgmental at all. <laughs> they certainly can make great companions. Her name is Dimona, actually, and she has been actually my best friend. She's in the same room with me all the time. Or perhaps it's fascination that so much personality can be packed into such a small and curious creature. It's also very interesting for me, almost like humans. like. You have to take time to understand all of the aspects of their personalities. But could it be even simpler than that? They're cute and I love them. Cats rule. <laughs> That's Maria Belzerini. She's the president of the Metro West Humane Society in Ashland, bordering Framingham. And wouldn't you know it, their nonprofit shelter is filled with cat lovers. We care for stray cats, cats that are surrendered, cats in the Metro West area that are brought to us. We care for their health, if they need spay-neuter, if they need a sur surgery of some sort, dental work, blood work, whatever. As long as it will um, help their health and increase their quality of life, we're willing to do it. A large part of that care includes what the MWHS calls their socialization program. Workers and volunteers spend a lot of time working with cats and kittens, including stray and feral cats, to get them more comfortable with human interaction. Vice President of the Board of Directors for the MWHS, Cheryl Mitchum. It's just amazing to see them blossom and become uh, able to get out of their cages and go into a, a room where we can actually sit down with them and, and they blossom even further and they come out and they, they want to be near us. They start rubbing up against us. Hi, bud. That blossoming makes it more likely for these furry little friends to find a home and stay there. We see miracles every day. Cats that would not be near you for a second become lap cats over, over time. It takes time. Time and hard work. It's not all just fun and games, at least for some of us. It is a lot of work, but it, it is the compassion of everyone that we have here. All of our volunteers, our staff, it's giving these little beings a, a shot at life, a loving life. And it just feels, I think you'd see them, it, it feels really good to, to let them find their home. The Metro West Humane Society takes their adoption process very seriously to ensure that all of the love and care they've put into these companions continues on to their forever home. You can look at an application and see good things, but when you see the magic between the cat and the human, then you know you've got the right family. That's one of the joys of my life, is getting them matched with the perfect family. It's just a wonderful thing. He's perfect. And thanks to Mackenzie and Jesse for that. The MWHS depends on monetary donations and supplies from the community. Maria told us that she's always amazed by their generosity. The shelter is looking for more volunteers to help their efforts, and they want to get the word out about a need for more foster homes as well. Their foster care program supports cats or kittens until they're adopted. If you would like to get involved or donate, you can visit the Metro West Humane Society's website at metrowesthumanesociety.org, or you can follow, find and follow them on social media. You're also welcome to drop donations off directly at their shelter located at 30 Pond Street in Ashland. 
As for what else is happening in our community, the city of Framingham is seeking five residents to volunteer for the seven member community development committee. This committee works alongside the community and economic development department to complete a number of different tasks from holding public hearings on housing needs and additional development to recommending courses of action to the mayor and city council. The deadline to apply for one of those seats is Tuesday, December the 5th. Meanwhile, for all of you with an interest in astronomy, Framingham State University's McAuliffe Center will be hosting a community stargazing event on Monday, November 20th. You can explore and observe the night sky with staff members and their telescopes. The moon, Saturn, Jupiter, and a double star named Albireo will all be visible, assuming of course that the skies are clear as the event is weather permitting. All are welcome to attend from 4.30 to 6 p.m. at the McCarthy Center patio. Thanksgiving is just one week away from today as we're recording, but there's still plenty of time to help feed a family here in our community. The United Way of Tri-County is hoping to feed 3,000 families this holiday season. Your gift of $50 will provide a local family with a complete Thanksgiving meal or groceries. If you would like to make a donation to the United Way's Feed a Family Holiday Meal Drive, you can visit their website at uwotc.org. And speaking of the holiday being right around the corner, it's almost time for Thanksgiving high school football here in Framingham. The Framingham Flyers will be, will be playing their rival, the Red Hawks of Natick High School, in the battle for the Elks Trophy. It's the 117th iteration of their holiday matchup. Framingham High School will be looking for their first win over Natick since 2018. This year's game is being held at Bowditch Field on Union Ave. Kickoff will be at 10 a.m. Thanksgiving Day. Tickets are available online by checking the Framingham High School Athletics Facebook page. Admission is $10 for adults and five for students. We'd like to now take a moment to remind you that The Frame is an initiative of Access Framingham, your local community media center located at their studios on Vernon Street. We're able to present The Frame to you thanks to them. To find Access Framingham, tune in to RCN Channel 3, RCN HG, HD Channel 1100, Comcast Channel 9, or Verizon Channel 43. The Frame airs on Access Framingham weekdays at noon and 7 p.m., as well as on Saturdays and Sundays at noon. To learn more, head to www.accessfram.tv. That'll be it for this week's Framingham News in Focus. Thank you for spending your time with us tonight. We'll be off next week due to the holiday, so let us here at The Frame wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. My name is Brendan Fitzpatrick. Take care.